is our seventh annual Europe Week. Uh, we're so excited to, um, to be doing this event today and to have all of you with us. Um, thank you for tuning in during your lunch break. Um, I am thrilled to welcome Professor Randall Halle today, who is going to be talking, uh, the, the talk is entitled Promoting Europe from Films and Newsreels to Streaming Media 1945 to 2020. Um, so we're, we're really, we have a, uh, a, a film expert um, in, in all senses of the word. Uh, Professor Randall Halle is the Klaus W. Jonas Professor of German Film and Cultural Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. He's also director of the Film and Media Studies Program, as well as the director of the Critical European Cultural Studies PhD Program. Um, and we're excited to see where those programs go. The Cultural Studies PhD Program is relatively new. So if anyone has any questions about that, please feel free to ask. His books include The Europeanization of Cinema, German Film After Germany, Queer Readings in Social Philosophy and the co-edited volumes After the Avant-Garde and Light Motives. His essays have appeared in journals such as New German Critique, Screen, Camera Obscura, German Quarterly, and Film Philosophy. Professor Haller works primarily on film and visual culture. His next book, Visual Alterity, is forthcoming, and he is currently turning his attention to European dis slash union, which is, I think, something we'll also want to be talking about today. Professor Halle has received grants from the, lots of acronyms here, NEH, DAD, and the SSRC, <laughs> National Endowment for the Humanities, the German Academic Exchange Service, and the Social Science Research Council. He was a senior fellow in the Berlin program, advanced German and European studies at the Free University, was, was uh, sorry? That was someone else. That was someone, oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <laughs> anyway, never mind. Okay. <laughs> um, in any case, you've had lots of, there are lots of accolades here. Um, was the first occupant of the newly endowed Jonas Chair at the University of Pittsburgh, was a senior Fulbright researcher in Berlin as well. Um, so we're really eager um, to hear all of what you have to talk about today, to engage in a very um, interesting discussion about the films that you're going to be showing us today. And before I turn it over to you, I'd just like to thank our sponsors. A special thanks goes out to the University of Pittsburgh's European Studies Center, a close, close uh, sister center of, of the UNC Center for European Studies here. Um, we're grateful for your support. In addition, the UNC Curriculum in Global Studies, the UNC Curriculum in Peace, War, and Defense, the UNC Department of Germanic and Slavic Languages and Literatures, the UNC Department of Romance Studies, UNC Global, and the UNC Russian Flagship Program. So thank you all for joining us. Randall, I'm going to turn it over to you and please, please, please put your questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you for the invitation um, and for everything. Thank you, Allison, for um, helping uh, with all of the stuff today. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I'm going to maybe a couple times throughout just post this because I know as people come in, um, um they, they they won't be able to see what's in the chat but i just put a document in the chat so that this which is a little bit of show and tell you can also um uh, kind of keep me honest and you can participate in the research itself along the way so um we'll see how that goes um but um um, I am interested in um, this project, uh, presenting, promoting Europe uh, to you today. And actually, after that um, introduction, <laughs> I really um, this this um, I, I, I just feel touched and 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 kind of embarrassed. And I, I and I would like to be that person that you described. Uh, so hopefully, I'll live up to that. The uh, Visual Alterity book is out now. It just it just appeared, and those have been projects that have largely been about feature film. And just for those of you who don't know my work, um, I've really been working on feature and experimental film, and in relationship to Europe, processes of transnational film production, market and state policy and politics. Um, but this new project, um, uh, which We'll see how European disunion, this is part of it. Uh, it may be coming its own project on its own, what, what I'm presenting here today. Uh, but it's really a new focus on moving images of the European movement and much smaller films, uh, short films, documentaries, very few feature films at the moment. And, and I'll give you some 
overview of, of what this project looks like in, in, um, in the course of the presentation today. But foundational work, uh, I just want to um, express my appreciation to foundational work by Gabriele Clemens and Anna Brüch, uh, a group who uh, have published a massive study, Werden für Europa, not translated, but um, they did compile a collection of films that is at the um, Historical Archives of the European Union in, uh, at the European University Institute outside of Florence. And much of that is stuff that you need to go there. There are many worse things you can do uh, with your life than hang out in the hills above Florence uh, watching films um, and eating nice food in the evening. But um, it's, it's well worth investigating these. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the resources that I've consulted in a second. But the second foundational project is Eugen Pfister's Europa in Bild, uh, which has really been a kind of comparative study of newsreel footage from the post-war period and very helpful to me in thinking about what I've been doing. Um, and just to, uh, in the document that I shared with you, there are links to all of these various sites. Um, and I certainly want to send a shout out to my own home institution and our archive of European integration as a great archive if, if, of, of documents and all sorts of resources if you haven't used it. Um, but there's a number of other archives that I've been using here and the Centre Virtuel de la Connaissance uh, is, is certainly an interesting one. And I'll look at some of these uh, in the course of this presentation uh, and come back, especially to the audiovisual service of the European Union in a moment. Uh, but as I said, just to give you a little bit of overview of the kind of work that I'm looking at, the initial period and the initial uh, project, we might say, has been need the sound. There we go. Um, the initial period of um, uh, images, the corpus of images I'm looking at, is really defined first by newsreel footage from not just the post-war period, but the immediate end of the war period. So already in 1944, as the German troops are withdrawing, you have French resistance groups uh, uh, creating newsreels and uh, getting information out and reestablishing a kind of network of, of information. And what we can find then is the, the newsreel production really creates the first set of images and symbols uh, for thinking about Europe and to underscore that in those resistance movements, part of what's happening is a goal of restoring Europe. So within the, the midst of the cataclysm, the, the solution to the crisis of Europe is oriented towards solving um, it through more Europe. And we have then a number of organizations already forming in oriented towards uh, European Federation, all culminating in then the 1948 Congress of Europe in The Hague. Uh, and these, these initial sort of images of war post um, of, of devastation start to give away to celebrations of European unity and building a kind of collection, as I keep saying, of images and, and, and symbols, um, different ways of thinking about political ordering, um, different kinds of gatherings of European founding fathers, quote unquote, um, buildings, headquarters, not yet flags, currency, passports, these sort of, sort of things, borders, just as we're seeing right now, dropping uh, gatherings, et cetera. This is really a, a, a body of information uh, and especially within the newsreel footage, I just want to underscore that from Italy alone, um, the um, documentation center of the presidency of the Council of Ministers sets up a special section to produce uh, newsreel footage for export um, from 1952 to 1962, over 200 short subjects. And this is just one unit in Italy, uh, 4,000 copies. And part of the idea there is to send out information that shows, in effect, Italy becoming 
um, a respectable member of the community of nations, of, Europe, of the European community of nations in many ways. So there's, there's multiple kinds of motivations for this creation of Newsreel, but much of it is already oriented towards Europe as such. It flips all. Europe, which is divided into 27 independent countries. Let me pause for a second here. Because it does, I, I, I want to show you um, just the opening of this particular film, but we do move over then from out of newsreel footage into the formation of short and eventually feature films. Uh, very few feature films, but this one uh, that we're looking at could be described as the first European feature film from 1951 by Henri Stock, uh, who's uh, well known as one of the sort of um, Belgian experimental documentarist filmmakers. Uh, the Smuggler's Ball is generally a failure, uh, but uh, it, from, it, I mean, at the box office and what have you, at that moment, uh, it is a failure, but it's a project that's really worth, in, worth watching. And so let's just watch the opening sequence here and you will go backwards to start out in here, but you'll, you'll see a bunch of... Europe, which is divided into 27 independent countries, is today trying to unite. Belgium and the Netherlands are endeavoring to create an economic union. The village of Dorpveld, where Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany meet, has three borders. Two of these borders are to be opened. The third one will remain closed. Pour vous. La Catherine qui est venue faire un petit tour en Belgique. Une couche qu'elle fait un rêve chez toi, ouais. Alors, il chie, hein. Mais elle a pas de passeport. Et puis l'herbe de Belgique, elle pousse pas pour les vaches hollandaises. Chacun chez Okay, I'm going to stop there. And you can see that there's some really charming things going on here. But uh, jumping back to what I was saying before, it starts out with maps. It starts out in uh, the uh, the information, uh, informationally um, conveying um, data about what Europe is and a concern with borders. And in some ways, actually, just seeing that, it, it feels to me like it's really uh, au courant at the, uh, you know, that, that, that it hasn't become historical yet in some ways. So the argument of the film, we, we, we see a border being raised and, and jokes about the Dutch cow going over into French grass to, to come back to Belgium, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the argument is that borders are only serving to keep smugglers in, in, in business. And uh, a whole kind of smuggler story uh, develops that has kind of action and chase sequences and things like that associated with it to make an argument that the Bene Lux, which is already at the forefront of creating a free trade zone, uh, should serve as a model for opening up borders in the rest of Europe. And this is, this is before the coal and steel community and, um, and different kinds of opening of borders. But we'll see that this is a, this is a language uh, that, that returns to us repeatedly. Um, so I promised you, though, a very broad stretch of time. Uh, and I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, but I do want to say that, that one of the things that's interesting for us in my argument about newsreel footage as the foundation is that the newsreel era ends at the end of the 50s with the advent of television. And when, one of the things that's interested me is the way that each of the kinds of technological, technological transformations have also created different kinds of visual information. And we can, we can explore that, but the European Commission is has been at the center of already 
television, televised broadcast for information about the European project. Um, and the um, formation uh, already 60 years old, the European Commission's audiovisual services um, moved into the new headquarters building of the European Commission right from the start in the basement. That's how central the idea of the production of images had been at that point in time. And that unit is a, is a fantastic unit and well worth exploring uh, in all of the sorts of things it does. And most of it is accessible, most of it is downloadable, uh, and, and has gone through all sorts of different iterations from television to satellite, uh, information media, social media, and streaming services, and uh, really is now providing news feeds for broadcasters. And if you look right at their audiovisual archives, um, there are, in October, I searched uh, and created this um, screenshot, and we can see that there's more than half a million um, items um, in their archives that were available as of it's not a movement of parties, my, my not a movement resulted of in uh, recognizing that they've increased by 20,000 more since October. So this is, this is the largest archive of European images, and it is embedded in the European Union uh, itself, the European Commission, and it is gathering also images from other places. So here we can go historically back to this um, uh, early European movement, uh, and we can move forward. Uh, and, and I had in a previous iteration uh, images from uh, Brexit, um, but I thought I would just check to see if indeed, and it turns out that Sofagate uh, is um, already on the archives here. So if you want to see, let me see if I can skip forward a little bit here so that we can see uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, in her <coughs> uh, moment. Um, but the, uh, exactly. And, and, and I found this piece in particular interesting for the way that it was edited um, and kind of uh, quickly cutting over and moving into, but not ignoring the way that um, if, if, if those of you who are watching haven't, haven't um, don't know about Sofagate yet after this, Google Sofagate and you'll find some exciting moment from, from the contemporary EU politics. But this is, this is an amazing resource for you and can be used for teaching, can be used for research. And, and as I just did, you can download these images and you can work with them in, in various ways. And it's encouraged um, to, to um, have access to and deploy these images yourself. So as I said, I'm interested in the way the images are produced, the technologies that produce them. Uh, and what I'm really kind of concerned with in the project at the moment is figuring out how the relationship with image to the imagining of Europe uh, is functioning. And I'd like to then look with you at some examples of how this works. And I already said newsreel footage, short films, feature films, but here, just as an example, finds, um, advance in all sorts of genres, uh, including animation. There are a number of uh, very important and interesting animation pieces. This is done by Alfred Wunza, who was an Austrian exile who went to Britain, who then came to France to produce this um, uh, piece uh, celebrating the coal and steel community, coal and steel union. But uh, for those of you who have background in um, the UK, uh, you may know him from uh, the sort of child, um, if in Pittsburgh people know Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood with a passion, Whirligig and Wormser's um, animation strategies are, are well known, but it wasn't known that he was also doing this for the European movement. Uh, and that's one of the things that I wanted to underscore that, that the resources here that I'm looking at um, encompass all sorts of genres like that wonderful little film um, but also then in the post-war era, we can see a number of uh, important uh, camera people, uh, editors, but also directly actors, actresses, and filmmakers 
getting their start in contributing to the European movement. So the Tadiani brothers, who are two of the great duos of post-war Italian cinema, uh, actually in the histories are described as solely oriented towards Ita Italy and Italian cinema, but their first film is actually a film, a short feature about uh, the Villa Falconieri, which became the first European school for diplomats. Um, and that's a piece from 1961. So we have the opportunity by looking at this material to rewrite film histories. Um, and we can find then uh, a very significant pre-war individuals participating in projects. This piece, Saarland Glück auf, Saarland in Good Luck uh, from 1951 includes as its cameraman, Henri Alacan, who is one of the great camera people uh, of uh, French cinema. And for those of you who know the work of Ben Benders and um, Wings of Desire in particular, Alacan did uh, in his very last projects, do the camera work for that film. So we see here uh, a film that is a um, fictional film, but nevertheless embedded with documentary, um, discussing the condition of Zaland, which the Tsar at that point in time is an independent uh, entity uh, and is a place of extreme tension and uh, anxiety around uh, French-German relations. And this film uh, is in many ways producing a czar identity within a European context, uh, which uh, was really a way of trying to reduce the tensions of the period. And without the Schumann plan, uh, we may have um, been in a situation where the two former combatants, we always think about the Cold War, uh, on the eastern border, but there were extreme tensions on the western, in the western regions as well. And so in this film, we, we move from typical images of devastation into a story about rebuilding the Tsar uh, within a kind of European context. It's well worth looking at. It's only 12 minutes, uh, but it's filled with amazing images uh, from the period. I want to explore with you for a little bit longer though, just stick with uh, this film for a little bit because this is just absolutely a, a delight to me. And let's see if it will start playing, there we go. Um, this film uh, is from 1951, is an Italian film. Uh, it's set actually in the future. Uh, so even though it's in 1951, it actually is set as a flashback uh, to a historic moment. And you can see that it has this kind of quasi-futuristic quality to it in which we move back in time to explore an era in which Europe is divided by borders. And the, it, the film itself, the, the framing narrative says, oh, can you imagine how that was? But this is set against a backdrop of um, kind of uh, of, of real tension at the time and important transformations in Italy uh, and is in many ways addressing things like the question of Tyrol, which was up for debate again in 1946, the question of the communists in 1947, the opening of funds from the Marshall Plan and the, the emergence of the Italian economic miracle. What we see here is a passport office uh, in which there's absolute chaos and our main character uh, is about to enter in. I'm going to turn up the sound here so that you can, so that we can listen to this one for a little bit together. And I'm going to do an annoying thing of clicking away at this and just showing you what happens in the film and seeing if I can give you some of my favorite spots in the film. But let's just watch this opening sequence for a little bit. Venite a vedere, venite, guardate qua, venite a vedere da questa parte. 
Vedi la Vedi il fregante si può aspettare la fila. È grazioso il bambino. Quel signore lì che cosa sta facendo? Eh? Che cosa è questo? Il signore, la prego, Io sono campione di questo scopo. Dio ci dice. La miseria. Ecco Io come. il permesso di pesca ce l'ho, caro lei, la legge è la legge. La legge? Ma come si permette a lei di pescare eh, nel mio catino? Non vede che sto eh, facendo eh, il pediluvio? Eh, 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 Scusi, tesoro, eh, mi sento così solo in questo ufficio, così inutile. Viaggiare, viaggiare, eh, viaggiare. Scusi, il mio passaporto dov'è? In Spagna, in Turchia, magari nell'Afghanistan. Il mio passaporto è finito in Turchia. E dove sta? Ah, ovunque, ma non qui. Ma questo sono qua tra pazzo. Di professione, di e pitte e pitte, ho guardato un pochettino quello che mi ha detto. Sì, se So we have, we have here then a vision of Italian bureaucracy that plays with a kind of both slapstick but also surrealist entity, uh, this, this um, almost Dali-esque uh, vision of the back uh, behind the window scene. We have a trickster figure and the woman in braids uh, who becomes the second uh, character in the film is uh, Mark Margit Zeber who uh, was working in Tyrolean uh, broadcasting at the time. So she and he want to leave Italy and they're trying to get documents to be able to leave. He doesn't get, he gets a passport eventually. We'll see, we can, um, uh, he manages to get a passport. She only manages, let's skip forward a little bit. She follows him and she only manages to get a passport, um, a, a marriage certificate. And and in this kind of lottery situation, she gets a marriage certificate. Uh, he gets a passport, and so uh, basically in order to get out, without it being um, said in dialogue in any clear way, she follows him and uh, joins him in the journey north, uh, and presumably then now as his wife in some capacity, uh, they travel north, uh, they arrive at the border, uh, where they have to be exposed to a subsequent control of the car, um, but also a control of their bodies. Mm, so the border crossing entails uh, biometrics, uh, and uh, they go through all of these in a kind of chase scene uh, through opening and closing doors. And in that process, a horse, and eventually a baby appears uh, out of nowhere. And uh, they are then finally given access to leave. Um, but in being given access to leave, their car has been dismantled so much that they can't uh, even drive away. So they head now towards the Tyrolean, the Austrian border, uh, where the recognition that, oh no, it's now all going to start over again leads them to make the decision to not cross the border, but instead go and live in a tree. And this is a decade before Italo Calvino's uh, reflections in a very similar kind of paradigm. I'm not sure that Calvino saw this film, but it's, it's quite a possibility. But this imagining them of a United States of Europe from the position of the tree is central to this project. And it really is a project that, that uh, in 1951, already thought of in 1950, he is looking forward to the Treaty of Paris and the creation of the coal and steel community with the idea of Europe being the place of futurity in which all of these problems are going to be resolved. One of the things that... Um, that I'm interested in tracing out here is the way that different countries uh, participate in the imagining of Europe in their particular ways. Um, so I'll come back to Italy 
in a moment, but uh, everyone has some hopefully understanding that in France, the question of energy and the atomic energy and um, atomic energy in particular, uh, nuclear energy plays a very important role. And this project here uh, is really from that moment and is a really interesting uh, vision of thinking about Europe vis-a-vis -vis atomic energy and is suggesting in this kind of, as a, 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 again, a, a um, animated film in, in very um, uh, strong uh, colors, uh, the uh, looking forward almost to the 70s from, from its color scheme or to a Monty Python-esque strategy, um, poo-pooing the concerns about nuclear energy uh, and saying even cavemen used to be afraid of fire, um, but then they learned how to deal with it. And it moves forward into different capacities and shows you how safe nuclear energy is. And at this point, um, for those of you who know French. Maintenant, au service de l'homme, comme la vapeur ou l'électricité. Quant aux résidus nocifs de l'industrie atomique, ils sont enfermés dans des coffrets blindés qui les rendent inoffensifs et déposés sous terre ou en pleine mer à de très grandes profondeurs. So if you if you didn't if your French isn't up to it, uh, basically if you're concerned about nuclear waste, don't worry about it. We can always wrap it up, and the oceans are incredibly deep, and uh, and 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 we can just um, let it uh, go in this fashion. And I um, I will say that I, I the first time I saw this, I really was left with a dropped jaw, dislocated jaw, practically, at, at thinking about how these films help us understand the imaginings of a European project during that period, and also give us a, a perspective on where we're positioned at this point in time vis-a-vis -vis um, the, the goal of Europe in, in the contemporary moment. So one of the things in um, trying to contend with a mass of visual information that I've been doing seeking to chart out various ways of national engagement with the project of Europe. And I've already mentioned something about Italy. I just want to show you a couple things um, here to track out some, some of the developments of Italy's relationship to the European project. And I already noted that, that the idea of Europe as a space in which Italy rejoins the community of nations is important. There are various kinds of themes. And of course, with the Villa Falconieri and the Taviani film, we saw that, of course, another major theme is culture and architecture, um, but also then European schools. Uh, and part of the Year at Home at ISPRA uh, project is also the creation of a brand new set of European schools. For our purposes, just to keep us even more limited, I want to show you some of what happens with the idea of labor migration because I already mentioned the Italian miracle that we, most people know about the German Wirtschaftswunder, the German economic miracle, but, but the Marshall Funds unleashed economic miracles in various places, including in Italy, uh, leading to rebuilding and industrialization, participation in the coal and steel community, uh, contributed to uh, easy access to building materials, and, and rapid um, redevelopment and Milan for whatever um, contemporary uh, critics say about that moment. Milan is often a, a site of celebration here and the rebuilding of, of a new kind of Italy. Of course, that sets up the dynamic of North and South. And what we find then is indeed labor migration from the South to the North of Italy uh, actually leads very quickly to the Italian government um, endorsing the sort of strategies that we know uh, historically of sending Italian laborers out further uh, beyond, so outward migration. And therefore the coal and steel community is the ideal venue for that. And we can find then a series of films that celebrate, and right here we see in the celebration of of rebuilding and modernization in Italy, we see this sequence, which is a celebration of the sending of Italian workers out into Europe. And the language here is, we're being sent out as um, trained laborers and we're going to be celebrated 
uh, when we arrive in, um, in greater Europe. And we're going to help rebuild Copenhagen, we're going to help rebuild Amsterdam, we're going to help rebuild, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so again, you see then in the sequence of uh, kind of newsreel footage in this piece, uh, we see celebrations of talking heads and, and, and gatherings that I've already mentioned. But we find then, if you look at the links that I've um, given you in the document, um, that there are then further celebrations of the training of the hygiene of the preparation for the sending of bodies out into Europe with the anticipation that people of moral upstanding quality are going to be going out and, and will be received and celebrated and they will have been supported by their government. So that narrative uh, actually creates, oops, sorry, that narrative creates a dynamic problem and in this piece from 1964, uh, which hopefully will be able to get it started, right? In this piece from 1964, we can chart out a transformation in the assessment of the Italian migrant laborer and the beginnings of a critical relationship to um, the European project. And in this piece, Gli Isolati. I want to underscore that what's interesting for us here is furthermore, this is a piece, a documentary that was made for television. And uh, one of the things in this critical turn towards Europe that we can see is that the newsreel footage, which is traveling across Europe, uh, crossing boundaries and is being recycled across uh, boundaries, now meets television, which is oriented largely towards national audiences. And here, a new kind of documentary strategy, a critical documentary strategy, begins to investigate the actual conditions of the Italian workers outside of Italy. And it meets up with a problem that in the 60s, in the early 60s, overproduction of coal and steel in Belgium resulted in a situation where the commission reached a decision to ratchet down production in that region. And suddenly, the Italian laborers, who were never integrated, uh, are either unemployed or underemployed and living in conditions which are being investigated in this documentary. And it's this core of a transformation to a critical investigation. And here we see them doing things like hanging out in cafes, drinking and gambling, uh, playing this uh, Southern it Italian um, gambling game. Uh, and if we move, if I leap us forward uh, in this piece, uh, here we see one of our characters going into town and um, the open sign in the window with the red light is he's, he's looking at prostitutes. Um, the particular window is now closed, so we don't see him going to prostitutes. But this, this documentary, which, and I just want to turn on the sound for a second. That electronic, almost irritating sound uh, dominates two thirds of the film. The first third has some information, but the rest of it is this electronic music playing over these images of forlorn Italians, unintegrated, um, not moral, uh, not healthy, uh, isolated, hence the name of the film. Uh, and really actually undermining the logic of what uh, was promised uh, as part of the Italian um, states project. And we'll see in the 70s, and we could look and in the links that I've uh, shared with you, you can find um, uh, contributions uh, done by the Italian Communist Party criticizing the European project for, um, and the Italian government's decisions not to resolve unemployment or underemployment within the nation uh, before sending people out uh, into this condition in Europe. And this kind of uh, uh, critical language, uh, a, a European critical uh, language emerges in, um, and comes to the fore in the 70s. What's interesting though, 
um, just to sort of um, keep things for us here positive and hopeful is that we can find these kinds of projects that I've mentioned, uh, you know, um, television plays a very important role. And here in this piece, um, Italiani di Europa from 2008. Uh, so um, we find in this piece, and, and, and just the, the introduction is um, quite charming in many ways because you have the tricolor workers um, going off across Europe. And it's a multi part. Um, uh, project that was done for Italian television and showing the conditions of Italians in various countries in Europe. And this episode that I have here is actually the one that focuses on um, uh, the, um, Scandinavia and uh, Sweden in particular. And what we see here is an attempt to restore the vision of Italians in Europe to a uh, educated, to a um, successful, uh, and indeed uh, those kinds of early 1950s models of what Italians would look like when they go off into Europe. So um, the documentary comes to focus in on a number of figures, uh, and it shows then, for instance, this man who initially studied uh, in engineering in Italy, uh, but went to do his doctoral work in Sweden and has now remained there. And it shows that he has a, a, a white collar job at the university. It shows him in successful positions, being interviewed about that. We have other colleagues of his, um, this woman, Likewise, with a very similar background, working in biotech. And uh, at the same time, uh, we move forward in the documentary to a kind of historical overview of the experience of the first generation of Italian labor migrants. Uh, we see them now in an environment in which they can get the things they couldn't get at the beginning. So here, there's a, there's a store and you can get Italian food products. Uh, <laughs> panettone if you need it, but the charm of this also acknowledges uh, the hardships of being an immigrant, uh, being in Sweden, showing us how hard they worked, and we have interviews with people attesting to um, being in effect in the north and the cold and what that was like and being undervalued. We see them actually in, the, this setting is an Italian community center. Um, so we see them gathered and that they have resources. Um, and then we return to one of our figures who is now also helping out in a cafe. And we start to see that Italian culture it has now permeated Sweden. And so it's unimaginable that the Swedes could live without uh, Italian coffee and an Italian pasta. And this whole, this whole language then both returns us to the 50s promises and shows us their success. And, and this, is, this is an interesting project in 2008, uh, right at the moment of um, the Euro crisis and really a sort of production of a positive view of Italians integrated fully into a Europe that now is welcoming in which they're at home as well. And I just want to underscore that it's not the only kind of project that you can find. And you can find various kinds of reflections on then successes of integration. So we moved from that question of integration as a critical uh, problem of labor migration to now this history of migrants from an Italian perspective, but there's also other kinds of projects out there that are EU sponsored or that are national projects. So Europe through the generations in 2015 or the German project in Abnach Deutschen aus die Italiener kam from 2017 and off we go to Germany uh, uh, when the Italians arrived or when the Italians came. Uh, and those, those projects reveal to us a, a kind of transition in the thinking about one of the central topics of uh, Europe, uh, migration, open borders, 
labor migration and integration. And it certainly is not a dynamic that's gone away, but, but here we, we see something that also reflects on if there was success in this project, maybe we can look for through the tensions of the contemporary moment uh, and think of other ways uh, of moving forward. So um, I want to kind of summarize and bring this presentation a little bit to a close. I, 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 hope, I've, I, I hope I've intrigued you uh, and I hope I, I can, I'm, after I'm done talking here and, and I'm happy to engage you with your questions or comments about, about this, um, I'll, re, um, uh, I'll resubmit the, the document that I'm talking about in the chat function so that all of you have the ability to engage with and look at these resources and, and maybe we can form some kind of collective community because there's enough material here for all of us uh, to, to be working on. But I want to underscore just to summarize that there's the creation of what we might describe as genres, uh, building on the newsreel footage. Uh, we see the way that education, the development of the citizen worker, we see a focus on physical hygiene and mental health. These are all transitions away from the big questions of Europe into the lives of the individual as citizens. And we see then with the emergence of television, a kind of emergence of investigative journalism and critical documentary around the same time as the discussions of the lack of democracy and transparency in the European project begins. So there's, there's in these images a reflection of that. And for me, what's interesting is the way that time, if you will, is being played out here. So that Europe moves from being, in effect, in the early period, a future potential. It turns into a contemporary condition, right? And at that point, it moves uh, into a different kind of relationship, a more critical investigation of Europe. So instead of projecting out when Europe is here, all of our problems will be resolved in Europe. We have then instead a, we're in this European project, we're embedded in it, and is it successful, isn't it? And this, is, this begins, and, and this goes back to Katie's introduction of the, the idea for me of a European disunion, right? And then, but this is something that, that we have to understand as a dynamic of uh, integration, if you will, that every time you try to integrate something, you disintegrate something else. Every union entails a disunion, right? And so it is, however, embedded in this critical moment and something that we've inherited to the present that the disunifying aspects are those upon which a, not criticality, but a skepticality, uh, if you will. Is that, a, is that even a word? Sorry. Um, but a skepticism uh, emerges vis-a-vis -vis the European project, right? And, and so really, in, instead of understanding disunion as part of the dynamic, we see the disintegrative capacities as having this um, key to why Europe should be rejected. Um, What's interesting for me then as well that I've underscored here is that there are various national entries, various national stories. I, I could show you footage from Germany, which is similarly concerned with uh, the restoration of um, a role in the community of nations, of European community, right? Uh, and so that's one of the dominant themes of rebuilding, of course. Um, but also this kind of anxiety around the leadership role, uh, the economic leadership role that it winds up having in the kind of central, um, central dynamic there. We can find um, the Netherlands, uh, I've already mentioned something about France, England starts playing a role in, in producing images here. Each of them have different ways of entering here. Um, and um, let me just, just I kind of mention everything on that slide that's of interest to us. Oops, sorry. But just uh, three more slides. Uh, just uh, out of that summary, just some conclusions um, to underscore for us that the EU is not the telos of Europe, right? That, that Europe has a history with many configurations. And in these imaginings of Europe, one of the things that I want to underscore is that the imaginings are not necessarily the European Union, 
uh, but they are visions of a European project. And I keep, and I, and I, and this is one of the things that I keep repeating is that Europe, even if the EU, for whatever reasons, ceased to exist tomorrow, Europe would continue to exist. And hence, these kinds of imaginings of Europe, the ideational capacity of Europe to instill movement and organization is not something that will go away. But it's interesting for us to consider how that functions. So as I, as I said, Europe switches from a future place to a contemporary condition. And really on that level, uh, Europe for me uh, reveals itself in these films to be a discourse uh, and to be not itself a uh, stable place, but what I've tried to articulate in my own research as an interzone. And what's interesting for me is that Europe itself uh, is a space not in which a unity emerges, but an increasing capacity for particularities, right? And, and I think that that's something that's, that's really revealed to us in these uh, films. And I think what's, what's interesting for us to also consider is that many of these um, uh, experiences of the European project also have uh, parallel dynamics within nation building projects. But one of the things I find that's really important for us as Europeanists, as people interested in the European project, is that there is often a, an assessment of Jeffersonian democracy or Westphalian states and if Europe has not accomplished becoming a Jeffersonian democracy or a Westphalian state, uh, then it is a failure. And I think one of the other things that I would encourage us to consider here is the way that these films uh, can reveal to us not what, um, not what the ideal of Europe is, but actually what Europe is doing. And that's, that's a place of um, focus that I would encourage us all uh, to, to turn to, if you will. So with that, I'm going to stop and I hope that I've um, whetted your appetite for um, this work. And I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, I will resubmit in the chat. Thank you so much. Really, this is... Um... So many interesting things to think about. Um, so again, and, comment, and if you're if you're interested, you can you can watch at full length. And, and I mean, uh, if if you know French, the the uh, atomic one is just a, a, a trip to watch. Uh, it really is almost like an acid trip in many ways. The the the, the film, but the uh, but the Italian piece. Uh, uh, is 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 well worth watching in its in its uh, full length. So sorry, Kitty, I didn't. Yeah. No, no, I I um I completely. So I I don't. The French isn't good enough for the atomic one, but the the Italian one is a joy to watch. Um, for anyone who's ever um or all the memories for those who have been through lots of passport checks, uh, it's great to watch. And for all those who haven't, to get a sense of what people were feeling. Um, when those checks were happening. Uh, no, it's a real trip and just uh, sort of slapstick uh, the way it's exaggerated, but yet so much of it um, is relatable. Um, I thought it was wonderful. So I can also highly encourage um, spending a, a, just a few minutes watching it. Um, and there's, there's, I, I, please, um, please put your questions in the chat. There's, um, you know, we'll, we'll, um, we'll call on you. You're welcome to, to just go ahead and ask your question or, or um, I can read it out for you. Um, I would love to, to ask a little bit um, to follow up with what you're talking about um, with affirmative reporting, what the EU is doing, right? And, and how that relates to um, the EU's sort of communications problem. <laughs> um, and and that, um, that certainly so many citizens within the European Union feel they are European, right? And, and we've seen that, you know, we see that over and over. And, in, in um, both informal and informal conversations, right? That, that you know, um, and with the Brexit discussion, of course, how could this be, right? And we are all Europeans, but of course with national identities at the same time, but, but that yet what is the EU really doing for us is always this question that remains. And so this, uh, this 
idea of what the EU is trying to do, you know, trying to, um, and you know that, of course, our centers are in the business of, of um, informing folks here about the EU, and, and we hear colleagues over there say, the EU needs to do it here at home too. So I'm I'm curious about um, about this, how this is working with affirmative reporting, and and how also the um, the Creative Europe project, which I know that you've you've done with, how that's played a role. Um, you know, we've worked with um, we've invited EU um, Prize for Literature winners. You know, and and we we want you know this film is such an important this visuals as you've been saying is such an important piece of this. So I'd I'd love to hear more about. Um, about how Creative Europe um, and, and what, you know, we'd have to sort of take that apart, right? What's the goal of it? Um, and, and who is behind it? This kind these kinds of questions. I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Um, and I'll I'll stop there. I have lots of questions, but, uh, me, but thank you. <laughs> let, me, let me actually respond a little bit, but one, one thing, I know that you have your activities uh, right now. Um, however, tomorrow uh, there is uh, at Pitt, and JJ is um, with our conversations on Europe going to lead a discussion about Creative Europe as, as one of our conversations on Europe. Um, and it so happens I'll also be there in that, in that, in that conversation. Um, but I, I actually want to step back for a second. This, this is a, um, that, that's a great question. And I had the pleasure of interviewing in the midst of COVID, uh, doing a, a great Zoom interview with colleagues, precisely that ones who had the European audiovisual services and, and talked with them about their, um, the way that their unit functions and this very long history. And one of the things that was, that was very interesting in their retelling of the history of their institution because I, I thought to myself, well, it's interesting, here are all these images, but who are the people who are archiving the images and who are the, how are they producing these images? What is, what is the nature of it? And so the idea that there's a television studio in the, in the, in the basement of the building, um, broadcast people don't need light uh, by any means, right? So, so they're in the ideal place to allow the commissioner uh, or any of the uh, um, various DGs to come down and, and do public work at that point, or heads of state have used that broadcast studio uh, as a place uh, to make pronouncements. But what's, what's interesting is that they, I, I didn't know this, they, they um, described that Brussels, after Washington DC, has the largest press corps in the world. And right? so DC has the largest, Brussels has the second largest. But that that press court itself over the last decade and a half has been shrinking. And it's been shrinking in various ways around um, uh, the, the decline in print media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they have done two things. Uh, they tried at one point to do overtly positive um, broadcasting to create messages. And so, so um, the initial newsreel footage that I showed you is actually a compilation of newsreel footage from a series about the rise of Europe and the rise of the European project. And it's a very positive and hopeful kind of production. But they discovered that actually populist, uh, especially through the European Parliament, they, they were threatened uh, with um, uh, having their funding cut and all sorts of other um, problems uh, with, um, in effect, creating a EU level counter narrative to the Eurosceptic discussion, which is a national conversation. And so they're, they're in the position, they're in a, uh, in a position of having to negotiate well and, and I encourage all of you to, to, to engage with them because they're just really very smart about what they're doing. But they, they have to negotiate these dynamics uh, uh, and cannot counter the national uh, messages. But what they, what they have taken to is creating, and, and that's why actually Sophagate and the images of Sophagate that I showed you are kind of are, are themselves very interesting. 
because it's not just that um, film professor nerds can download that and, and use it in a, in, a, in a PowerPoint presentation, but rather they're actually providing broadcast ready information and they even provide in the style of a broadcaster so that now we cut to so-and-so in Europe and that can be inserted in television broadcasting on the national level. And so, so this is all in a very neutral language, uh, a production of information uh, without, but it's a production of information in the center of the European project. And on, on that level, it doesn't, it doesn't promote a counter European narrative. It simply provides a European narrative. And, and, I, and I find that that really is a, is a very interesting way that they're negotiating that. And, and again, it's an amazing resource for all of us to be looking at. And like I said, it's almost up to um, 600,000 um, items uh, for you to uh, look through. Um, is asking could, uh, about the reception of these films. Um, so there, there are, an, um, uh, there's a number of things that can be said about that. And uh, the newsreels, uh, it's, <laughs> It, 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 Katie, if you if you if you say that um, many of us don't remember what it's like to travel around in Europe, having to show our passports at every border, what we also don't remember is what it was like before television. In the moment where newsreel footage was something that was screened on a continual basis at the cinemas, that the cinemas were not just feature films, but in, in fact, the setup for many cinemas was such that you would buy a ticket and go into the cinema without knowing the time of a film screening. And you would come in with um, um, you know, a, a newsreel, a serial story, a cut back to a newsreel, maybe then the feature film, then cut away to a, a, a short comedy, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was a, it was a full ongoing cycle of, um, of entertainment, if you will, and information, culture, films, et cetera. And that was the venue in which these were playing. Uh, and they would have been, so it's, um, so it's a period in which cinema was really at its heyday um, before the advent of television. And so that newsreel footage and those initial films uh, were successful. I can say, however, that our Smuggler's Ball just, wasn't no one wanted to no one wanted to show it and in many ways i think it was partly because by the time it was released uh, its its story was already kind of over the european coal and steel community had already formed and so this this story but the smuggler story it actually remained a genre or it generated a kind of genre around to to this day um we're interested in european smugglers right and and traffickers and these sorts of things um so Mm, um, that film wasn't successful, but uh, his subsequent film was actually very successful, uh, a, a film that explored uh, the history of art uh, and European from the Renaissance to uh, uh, through uh, Dutch painting, mannerism, mannerisms, Turner, with, with each kind of vision of art history contributing within a national capacity to unity in diversity, right? Without being explicit in that language. And so there's a, there's a visual production of this unity and diversity. Um, the, the turn to television changes things, of course. And, and those uh, stories are then stories that are, that are reaching people in, the, uh, in, in, in their living rooms. And the last thing that just, um, <laughs> to say about success or lack of success, what's interesting here also is that uh, there are, I've discovered there are uh, around significant European moments that it, especially in France, there's shows uh, in the sense of variety shows in which um, a celebration of Europe uh, with song and dance and comedians uh, takes place. And so um, um, I don't, know how to say that there are specific numbers associated with that, but we can see then the production of new and ever kinds of transforming engagements with Europe. Um, yeah, I'll stop with that. Any, uh, yeah.
I'm not seeing other questions, but. Then I'll go ahead and ask another one. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about how this, so partly you just talked about it, this smuggler's ball genre. I can think of lots of, your, you know, modern day feature films that have that kind of um, crossing borders, Interpol sort of <laughs> um, fast paced kind of thing. But but could you talk a little bit about sort of how this is transformed? How, you know, what what is a European feature film? You know, what what counts as um, showing that kind of identity? We've we've um, you know we've looked at that great film about um, about exchange students all living together. Sarah knows the name. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Auberge Espagnol. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, right. That's just a really kind of um, is a great you know looks at it quite um, I think pretty realistically. Uh, but you know what you know what is that? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts sort of on on modern feature films and what does that mean to be a European film and and you know what what counts so to speak. Um, and for me, that's one of the, um, so, so my, my previous research has really been focused on the feature film and that's where the short films became a, a body of work that was uh, working in a very different fashion and is working in a fashion that's largely committed to a European movement in its initial period and then, and then representing for us these kinds of shifts. Feature films are interesting uh, in, um, for me, one of the things that's uh, under-recognized is the way that funding mechanisms work in producing European feature films. And um, really before 1992, uh, in order to do co-productions, um, the uh, agreements had to be negotiated uh, in international relations. So uh, to do a French-German co-production, you had to actually have a French-German uh, international contract between at the state level to allow that to, to happen so that, that export and trade, all of that made things very, very complicated. And there were this, there was this strange sort of network um, that, that emerged, not the EU, but the Council of Europe that other body, that other European body, uh, created a condition after, really after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in which a, um, all, the all the countries that are signatory to the Council of Europe also entered into an opening of uh, co-production agreements. So by simply becoming a member of the Council of Europe, you also signed on to the ability to do co-productions across. And, and we see then the emergence of all sorts of co-production capacity at that point in time, so in the 90s. And that was, that was one of the things that was really interesting for me because it's not simply a matter of the production of European images, right? But rather getting Europeans to be able to work together. So in one of my studies, um, uh, I have this discussion about, and now actually, I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I'm going to just blank on the year and the names of all the films, but I can tell you that one of the things that intrigued me was that in one year, there were three deaf films, three films about um, deaf culture. One was a Belgian documentary, the other was a, a, a short Belgian film, the other was a French feature documentary, and the third was, um, uh, beyond silence, James der Stille in Germany, and and that that's a lovely thing, and and it really feels to me to be um, a very German film. But I thought to myself, oh my goodness, uh, since the '60s there hasn't been any discussion of deaf culture, and then all of a sudden in one year there are three films, and I was able to identify that these are films that were generated out of a script development project. Uh, in which people came together. And that script development project was something that was funded by the European Union. Right? So um, back to our Council of Europe, um, the Council of Europe actually funds content uh, and does so with the goal of achieving European values films. And the first films that it funded in that context were 
um, Kishlovsky's Red, White, and Blue trilogy. So uh, stories about Polish, French, uh, back and forth relations with the goal of um, investigating political conditions. And, and, and that, that project seems to me to have set forward a kind of imagining within national specificities of the possibilities. And, I, and, and for me, what was interesting about that is uh, even though Germany's in between those two countries, it plays absolutely no role. Uh, and so, so there's a, the, even to the point where a person is stuffed into a suitcase and flown over Germany and ostensibly in order to avoid having to deal with that country. Right? But this, this becomes the kind of imagining possibility of a European space expressed and then other films like Auberge Espagnol. But I think um, what, is, what is for me still really also very interesting is we wouldn't notice the way that co-productions uh, work to produce European stories. Um, and um, yeah, I, I mean, th this, is, this is something I can keep going on. One of the things that's happening right now uh, that is also interesting is that Creative Europe, uh, which you asked about, emerged in some ways as an economic project in relationship to um, the moving image. Uh, the media program was the most successful and the media program began to construct an audiovisual sector. There hadn't been econ econometric analysis of a European audiovisual sector. There was questions about is film X successful or not, but um, the European Union level began to identify the audiovisual sector as a sector of massive growth and growth potential. And that's when it started to invest in trans-border uh, production support and exactly things like uh, script writing camps and uh, training sites for camera people and et cetera, et cetera, that bring people as crew together um, to think about European stories. One of the outcomes right now that, that if you're attentive to uh, German and French film production, you'll start seeing remakes a kind of back and forth of remix. Um, and so the, the, uh, the child who's named Hitler in France gets renamed, uh, gets remade in a German version. Uh, and um, uh, there's a number of these kinds of films uh, that, that keep getting remade across the, uh, across the borders. Um, yeah. Um, without trying to get too specific, but this makes me have a, I mean, I've always had huge appreciation for Alta, the German um, French TV channel or station one could say, um, but this is a huge new appreciation to have this, this context um, is really important and, um, and very, uh, yeah, just really puts it in a different light. Um, and I had no idea that it was so difficult to do those co-productions. <laughs> no. And, and, and actually, one of the things that's interesting just about Arte, for instance, is mm -hmm. that in the initial phase, it was a very creative and open space and still is a very important project. Um, but uh, it has had a, uh, um, it has had to negotiate funding questions. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Basically, uh, the funders say, well, very few people watch it. Uh, so therefore it shouldn't be funded as much and so therefore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, one of the sad outcomes of that uh, assessment of culture and cultural production has been that Arte uh, is more and more oriented towards a certain kind of format. Uh, so the, the documentary uh, has to follow a certain kind of format that allows it to be dubbed easily into another language. Oh, yes. And those, okay. those are things that, that on the one hand are really interesting and have positive outcomes, but you can watch it in, in if you look over the history of art, you can see that visual experimentation is less at this point and more a strategy of not necessarily showing lips or that sort of thing to interfere with the shift in um, into oh. a language. Um, yeah. And those, those kinds of, Mm, reductions, if you will, I find mm -hmm. that, that very interesting. Yeah. A bit forced. Yeah, yeah, great. I think that we'd all like to sign up for your PhD in uh, cultural European studies program. <laughs> um, 
Um, and I will um, I will quickly look and try and find the link for tomorrow um, for your event. Um, I, I should actually be able to post that myself. But, uh, okay. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah. Because you're, it, I think it's at noon, and our our um, Europe Week event tomorrow is at uh, at two, so it works out to come to both. Of course, you know, it's just what we want everyone to do. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Really appreciate everyone staying till the bitter end. Um, thank you for all of this information and and interesting viewpoints and recommendations. Thank you for the Google Doc. Thank you for giving us these snippets that we can then follow up on. Um, I put the link in the chat for um, tomorrow's pit event. Um, and we want to keep we want to follow what you what you keep doing. Um, please let's um, let's continue this conversation. Um, it's so important as you're just finishing up and saying this that what an image actually means, yeah, and and what what we um, and how that relates to um, to the broader European picture. So thank you, Randall, for taking your time. Thank you everyone for staying and for participating today. And um, I hope to see you all very soon.